there's a lot of people today, the pandemic made people reevaluate what their life story was a little bit. And we're seeing that with the great resignation going on. How, how does that all fit in, in your opinion? It's fascinating. I mean, obviously it's been such a weird messed up time now for almost a couple years, so much tragedy, so much loss, um, on a planet of eight plus billion people, you, you could have never engineered anything like this, but we have one of the greatest social experiments in the history of humanity, where almost everybody had to stop and lock down. And uh, what's, what's the old Blaise Pascal line from, I think, 1619 or so, like, you know, just, just something about how we're terrible about sitting in a room alone with our thoughts. Like we just, we can't do it. Well, <laughs> We were sort of forced to do that for, for months on end. And I think the silver lining to this, I'd say on net bad experience, has been that so many people have given themselves the permission to re-examine the life that they want to live. The great resignation, you know, you're you're more in the markets than I am. You 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 know the quit rates. You, you know the, the audience uh, understands that people are leaving their jobs and maybe not coming back. For all of us, the nature of work has been redefined because here we are on screens and it ends up that we actually don't need to go to those meetings in person. We don't need to commute 20 or 30 minutes or an hour a, a day or whatever it is. It's been an oppor- the, the great resignation above and beyond you know, the Bureau of Labor Statistics data has been this psychological and even existential experiment in who, who is it that I want to be? What work do I want to do? Who do I want to do it for? Maybe the fact that I can make slightly less money, but do something that's more meaningful and more comfortable and more convenient, may, maybe that's the way to go. And because of the lockdown off and on, people were forced to experiment with it. It's not like you even had, it's not like you even had a choice. So I think the quest for funded contentment, there's a little bit of a bull market in it because people are asking the hard questions that they wouldn't have otherwise. And, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm here for it. Well, and I think also as you shift your priorities, perhaps you start to redefine what enough is. Mm. Um, I think prior to the pandemic and there's, there's a lot of social status in climbing any sort of career ladder, um, as well as having enough money, making enough money. How do you think about that? Has it changed? How does it fit into this idea of funded contentment, living the life and writing the story Mm. that you want to have for yourself? Yeah. So I I love the question. It's hard to give. I I, I don't think current events changes the answers. I, I think what it does is sort of put bright yellow highlight on the question because we have had this this experience. I mean, think about, I mean, you know this data point, and, and the, I'm not sure if these are the exact numbers, but in many surveys, people would rather make $80,000 a year when their neighbors are making 60,000 than make $120,000 a year when their neighbors are making 150,000. Okay, so we are social creatures, uh, we are envious, um, we are competitive, uh, it, it's, it, different conversation that that's just who we are that sense of being wired um socially i i think you know there's sort of uh, there's maybe countervailing factors on the one hand i think a little bit on the margin i see and it's anecdotal obviously but people seem to care about that a little bit less because i do see in my personal life and my work life people saying you know what I, I'm, you know, I, I'm at a nine. I don't need to push for a ten. In fact, I'll downgrade to an eight, because you know the quality of my life has improved. You know, I, I went down one notch in terms of comp, but I'm going up two or three notches in terms of quality of life. And who the heck cares what my neighbor is doing? That's, um, I think that's going on. The flip side is that you know, to the old line, you know. JP Morgan, nothing corrupts your financial judgment more than the sight of your neighbor getting rich. Um, not, you know, back when he said this a hundred years ago, like you literally had neighbors. I mean, we still physically have neighbors, but now because of social media, everybody is your neighbor. Everybody lives out loud all day long. It's noisy. It's, it creates a number of problems. But now all we do is see what other people are doing. 
And so on the one hand, there's the resignation and people saying, huh, maybe I have enough, or maybe there's a better way to do this. On the other hand, there's a momentum trade in FOMO, this fear of missing out, <laughs> whether it be meme stocks like AMC and GameStop, whether it be uh, the world of cri crypto and uh, NFTs, um, where you see especially younger people making small or even big fortunes mm -hmm. uh, virtually overnight. And, and, and people say, geez, like, I, I can't believe this happened. Why is this happening to me? So we still have these you know, sort of countervailing pressures of not caring, but then caring, caring too much. Um, what excites me is that there's at least the opportunity for, you know, not just the great resignation, but the great reimagination to say, hey, maybe, maybe I want to be somebody different. And this time is so weird. Everyone's focused on themselves. Maybe I'll just focus on the way that I want to edit my story and write it differently because all of our stories are in pencil. They're not in pen. And so we can do things differently. And so finding that agency and that author authorship, it's awesome. And it's, and, and it's empowering.